All right, thanks, Jeff. We'll jump right into it. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on who I am. Uh, I figure this is Nanog. You guys will probably know more about me than I know about myself by the time I'm done up here. Um, but I did want to spend a minute on why I chose this topic, why I'm up here talking about this today. Um, and it really comes down to in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, I worked for a service provider in operations and uh, had the pleasure of tracking some DOS attacks at 3 o'clock in the morning. And um, at that time, we didn't have a lot of tools. We didn't have a lot of traffic graphing. We didn't have uh, NetFlow anomaly type of tools. We didn't have automation tools for automating our configs. And it was a very manual process. It was very tedious. It was, uh, you know, very cumbersome. And I remember thinking at the time, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, and so fast forward to today, I think VDOS mitigation using BGP flow spec is one of a number of, of tools that operators um, have in their tool belt that they can use for, for blocking DOS attacks. So um, again, I won't spend a lot of time on this. I'm assuming if you didn't think DDoS was an issue, you probably would have left the room before I started talking. But um, I thought these were some interesting articles that point out that not only is DOS attack something that's annoying, that takes up our time, uh, that's a problem that we as operators have to deal with. It takes us away from other things we'd rather be doing, but it's also an economic impact to, not, to us, to our customers. Um, as you can see from this NBC News article, they estimate that more than 40% of DOS attacks cost an estimate of a million dollars per day. So there's significant economic impact from this problem. Um, all right, so how do we used to block DOS attacks back in the old days, like I was talking about when I worked for an operator? Um, the customer would call in, they'd say, help, I'm being attacked, I, you know, my, my website is down in this, in this example. Uh, hopefully you got a hold of a guy in a NOC who had clue and config access. He could go in and uh, track back what the attack traffic was, figure out what that was versus legitimate traffic, put filters in place in the network, make the attack traffic go away, allow the legitimate traffic to flow through, and voila, your, your web server, in this case, is back up. Um, that was great. I mean, it's fairly easily to implement, and how to use it is, is I guess, fairly well understood, as, as long as you have not guys that are fairly well trained in the CLI on your, on your particular vendor's devices. Um, it does, however, require a degree of coordination between the customer and the provider because the customer has to call in saying I'm being attacked and, and the provider log in and take a look and figure out what's, what's happening. Um, and again, if you're in a large network uh, with lots of devices, this becomes very manual, very hard to scale. Right? Um, and I guess the last thing is that when you have people in putting filters in manually in routers, it's only a matter of time until somebody makes a mistake and you do something you didn't intend to do. All right, and that's a very costly problem. So then uh, we as an industry came up with this idea uh, of remotely triggered black holes, destination uh, remotely triggered black holes, that is. And the idea here is that uh, the victim initiates, when they, once they're under attack, they initiate a route back to their service provider telling them uh, what address is being attacked and that they want that address basically null routed in the service provider's uh, in the service provider's network. They do that through sending a discard community that they've agreed to beforehand with their service provider. Uh, the service provider then takes that BGP prefix, sets the, the next top to a discard route that they have configured on their, on their device, and they, they send that traffic to the, to the, to the bit bucket to the discard, right? Um, the only problem with that is then if you had that server only with one IP address, you've now completed the attack, right? The, the server's completely down. Hopefully you have DNS, you can just change the IP address for your server and it comes back up, assuming that the miscreants aren't uh, attacking you by name, they're only attacking you by IP address. So there's some, some pros and some cons to this approach too, right? This has been around for about 10 or 11 years, um, you know, and it, like I said, it was still better than the manual, um, manual process we were doing before, but um, it does require this pre-configuration of discard routes on all the edge routers and knowing what community you've got to send to your service provider in order to make this happen. And again, the, the victim's destination address is now completely unreachable for that attack. All right, so then the next step was an idea of source remotely triggered black holes. And the way this works is um, normally, again, we go back to where the, the person under attack has to call in and say, hey, I'm being attacked. The knock person puts in a, a black hole route uh, in a route server that advertises out to all the service providers routers um, and what this actually does is 
null routes the the source instead of the destination essentially and it works in combination with with RPF or source address validation whatever your, your particular vendor calls it to drop the source of the traffic instead of the destination of traffic all right and then hopefully if that works well your web server is back up the IP address is still reachable by everybody except for the source of the attack Again, this is something that's been around for quite a while. Came was a, an RFC that was approved in 2009. Um, again, it requires a decent amount of pre-configuration before the attack. You have to put in the discard routes and you have to have uh, RPF or, or source address validation configured on all your interfaces in order for this to work correctly. Um, again, the, the advantage is that the victim's address to nation address is still usable. Um, but it only works if you have a known or a small handful of source addresses. If it's, if it's widely distributed, this is probably a little bit less than useful. All right. So enter BGP flow spec. Um, this is a, an RFC that's been around now for about five, well, I guess going on six years. Um, it is an IETF standard. Um, we define new BGP, AFI and SAFI, new NLRIs for advertising. Um, information about the attack to our, our routers and I'll go more into to what the what that is um, BGP flow spec has this idea of validating the routes against the unicast routing table to make sure that someone's not the goal being to make sure that somebody's not advertising a route a black hole that they don't own that they're not already advertising to you as a service provider uh, via unicast BGP um, once that's validated, then those BGP routes are actually turned into an access list or a firewall filter to take whatever action you have specified you want to take for that traffic, right? Um, so the, the, the good news about BGP flow spec is it's a lot more uh, robust in the things that you can do. So you can do things like destination and source prefix, a combination of those, protocols, ports, ICMP flags, TCP flags. There's a lot of different things that you can match on so you can get a lot more granular instead of just black holing an entire, uh, an entire IP address. And then you can also take multiple actions. Probably the, the two most common here are dropping it, setting a traffic rate to zero, or doing a redirect. But you can also mark it with DSCP values um, as well, or sample traffic. Um, and I think, an important thing to note here is that this is this is something that um, is gaining more traction in the industry, I think, over the years. Um, it's not something, I know I'm a Juniper employee standing up here talking to you about it, but it's not something that only Juniper supports, right? This is not a, an exhaustive list. There are others out there, um, but this is just some something that I, I researched and, and put into the deck for, to make my point here. Uh, so there's a number of, of vendors that have detection tools that support B creating BGP flow spec routes and sending those out, uh, as well as router vendors that support receiving the flow spec routes and, to, and creating those firewall filters, those ACLs, uh, to block the traffic. All right, so what makes BG BGP flow spec better? And I alluded to some of this, and, and it comes down to gives you more granularity uh, than just a straight access list. It gives you the same granularity that you had with access list, right? Um, you get a lot more particular about what the what the traffic is you want to block versus the traffic you want to allow, but it gives you the similar automation that we had with remote trigger black hole, where either uh, from an internal route server you can advertise those routes, or if you trust your customers, you can allow your customers to send you flow spec routes and, and block traffic based on their routes. Um, and again, it it leverages the BGP best practices and policies that we as an industry have been using for years. Um, it's not like we're running a new protocol to, a, to accomplish this. So, all right, so what would, what would an, an inter-domain DOS mitigation using flow spec look like, right? Um, and this is where you have a customer that you, or you're allowing them to send you flow spec routes. So your victim is being attacked. They have a web server, and in this example, the particular attack, they're getting a DNS attack, 53 UDP attack. So they send a flow spec route to their service provider saying, um, please block or rate limit to zero my, uh, my destination address, all packets that are 53 UDP, right? That route's received by the service provider. It's, it's sent to all of the edge routers. Uh, it's, like I said, set with an action, action to a rate of zero. The traffic is then black holed in the edge routers via um, an automatic access list or a firewall filter. 
the attack traffic is dropped, the legitimate traffic continues to, to pass, and then the customer's web server is back up. Um, this, of course, allows the customer of the ISP to initiate their own filters automatically. Um, it, of course, on the service provider side, is going to require same filtering of BGP to not allow um, you know, them to send you a ton of routes, routes they don't own, those kind of things. Uh, just good common policy and procedures there. All right, so what would, what would configurations look like? And again, I want to point out that this is not just something that, that one vendor supports. So I have just three examples, and again, not necessarily an exhaustive list of vendors and what their configurations look like. And for the example that I just showed where you're receiving BGP flow spec routes from, from, a, from a customer, all you really do is turn on the flow spec NLRI that I talked about that we've added to, to BGP and pretty, pretty straightforward from, from that perspective. All right, so as far as intra-domain DDoS mitigation, so this is if you, if the last one was a little too scary for you to allow your customers to send you flow spec routes, if you don't have that kind of trust in your customers, I get it, okay. So what, how do we do it if we want to do it inside of our own domain, inside of our own control? All right, so presumably your customer has to still call you and say, hey, I'm being attacked, um, the knock logs in and configures the flow spec route on the route server or has some automated tool that does this for them. The flow spec routes go out to the edge router, same as before, the, the edge router receives those routes, creates the firewall filters, the access list that pushes down to the forwarding plane um, and, and drops the traffic. The DNS traffic is scrubbed out, the, uh, the DNS attack traffic is scrubbed out, the legitimate web traffic continues to pass. Right. Um, again, this could be initiated by a phone call into the NOC. You could um, have a detection tool that you're running, uh, looking at your flow data to, to, to see when there are traffic anomalies, or you could create a web portal where a customer can log in and tell you the information about, the, about what kind of attack they're seeing, and that be what actually generates the flow spec route on your route server. Uh, no matter how you do that, you still have to require a coordination between your customers and yourself if you're the service provider, of course. Um, so what do, what do these configs look like? Again, the edge router config looks exactly the same because it's not doing anything different. Uh, I just put it here for, for completeness, but it's the same as it was before. What we do have uh, different um, on the route server, now we have another router in there, so we have to create the... the um, to turn on the NLRI for BGP flow spec on the route server as well. And then, um, as far as I'm aware, Alcatel's current code doesn't allow you to create flow spec routes to use as a route server to create these, but I, I could be mistaken on that. But I found Cisco's config and Juniper's config on how you create the route. And essentially, we're creating a flow spec, we're creating a new route that's a flow spec type route um, and injecting it into BGP and advertising it from the route server out to our, out to our edge server. All right. Again, we could do this through some sort of automation tool through a web portal, or we could have a, a, a knock engineer who's doing this manually. Scrubbing center. So another thing that uh, is, is of interest, I think, to the community and it's being done quite a bit is instead of just black holing it at the edge of the network, uh, maybe taking like that entire slash 32, maybe that entire slash 24 even, that's being attacked and redirecting that to a scrubbing center that may have some sort of deep packet inspection um, tools that can scrub out the attack traffic and then pass the legitimate traffic on to the customer. So, again, the customer calls in or somehow notifies you that they're under attack. Uh, the NOC configures the flow spec route on the route server, uh, very similar as what we've already seen. But instead of setting the action to a, to a rate limit of zero to, to drop the traffic, we're actually um, setting a redirection to redirect this to a scrubbing center. The, all of the traffic, both legitimate and uh, attack for this particular route, are then sent to the scrubbing center. Bad traffic is taken out. Uh, the legitimate traffic is sent back on down to the data center and ultimately on to the customer's web server. Um, of course, it's important to note here that if, if you're doing this, once it leaves the scrubbing center, you've got to put it in some sort of tunnel, either a GRE or a VRF, some sort of tunneling mechanism not back into the global routing table, you'll, you'll create a loop. Um, the other way to do this would be to, to have the tunnel be between the edge router and the scrubbing center, and then the scrubbing center put it back in. 
in the global table. So one or the other, you just can't have both ends of that equation in the global routing table uh, without creating a loop. Um, it, this allows you, of course, to mitigate the, the attack without completing the attack like you do with a remote trigger black hole. Uh, what is, so what does an edge router look like uh, in this type of scenario? And from, from the edge router perspective, it's again the same that we've seen on, on all the previous slides. All we do is just enable the, the BGP flow spec NLRI. Um, same thing on the route server, we enable the NLRI. And then we go in and we create a route, but you'll notice this time, instead of setting our action to be a rate limit of zero, uh, we're actually setting it to rewrite the next hop to the IP address, presumably that's the router in our scrubbing center that's gonna receive this traffic, or the appliance um, in our scrubbing center that's gonna receive this, this traffic. All right, so if I've done this, if I set this up in my network, how do I know it works? So I put together a few show commands across all three of, of the vendors I've been using as an example here. Things you can look at to see, um, are the flow spec routes being generated? Are they being announced? Are they being uh, received? And ultimately, are my firewall filters being um, created in the forwarding plane and, and are they actually getting hits against them? All right, so where, where are we as an industry going? Um, so again, this this, BGP as a flow spec, as a technology, has been around for about five or six years now, um, but there's still work being done in the IETF, there's still work being done in the vendor community to add more features and functionality to it um, every day. So one of the things that uh, we're working on is adding in this protocol you guys may have heard about called IPv6 that we may or may not at some point adopt. Um, so we're gonna add that into flow spec um, so that you know, we can scrub out not just IPv4 attacks, but also IPv6 attacks. Um, there's some discussion ongoing about doing some relaxing of validation because when you do some interesting things with your route server, you may not necessarily have the same path for receiving those routes that you had for the unicast. So you may have to relax a little bit of the validation rules specific for certain use cases where the path may be, may be different and come up with a different way to validate that these routes are authenticated and, and sh should be allowed. Um, and then some additional um, next hop options when you're when you're trying to do things like the redirecting to a to a scrubbing center uh, there's some some additions being done in, in the ietf for that as well all right so that's kind of bgp flow spec and, and where we're at um the second half of this this deck I, I sent out a survey that a lot of you may have seen to the nanog mailing alias um asking about people's thoughts on bgp flow spec had they adopted it and so forth I wanted to provide the results of that survey um, and, and kind of where people see us uh, as an industry when it comes to flow spec. So not surprising since this is Nanog that the majority of the respondents are in technology or telecom or internet type of industries, but there were a few other industries responding, things like education, uh, entertainment and leisure, uh, finance. So, you know, a little, little bit of uh, people outside of, the, of pure internet um, telecom type of companies responding. All right, so the first question in the survey was, do you have or have you ever enabled BGP flow spec um, in any part of your network? And the majority here almost, we'll call it 61% of people haven't, haven't tried it. Um, and I think that really comes, comes back to why I wanted to come and talk about this today. I just kind of want to raise awareness about it. I'd like to, to make kind of a call to action to the community. Uh, you know, if you've got a lab, try it in the lab. If you, you know, maybe, and put it in a sanitized area of the network where if something went wrong, it wouldn't have a, a huge impact. Try it there, you know, kick the tires um, and let your vendors know, hey, this is working for me, this isn't working, I need additional functionality. I think the more that we, we talk about this technology, the more that we try it, the more that we figure out what's working and what's not working and have these conversations, the better this is gonna get over time. Uh, so the next question in the survey was, if you have not enabled it, why have you not enabled it? Um, the, the two most common answers here, as you can see, were not familiar enough with it. Again, that comes back to why I'm here. I want to continue the conversation, get people talking about it, um, learning about it, hearing about it, knowing what it does. Uh, the next most common response was that it's not a high priority. So, um, you know... People have just been busy working on other things, haven't gotten a chance to get around to it. 
Beyond that, there were some, the, the, I think the next most common thing that, that, that I hear, not just in a survey, but in talking to people about this, is uh, a lack of vendor support or a lack of vendor scale. Um, I think that is, is getting better. Uh, there's still, you know, some, some features that aren't supported. There's still some scaling that need, work that needs to be done by the vendor community, um, obviously. But I, I, th I think that's, that's getting better as we go along as well. Um, so the next question was, if you have enabled it but have since disabled it, why, um, why did you disable it? And in the, in the NA here, I, I interpret to mean that for the most people who have enabled it in their network and have given BGP flow spec a try, they've left it on, right? They haven't gone back and disabled it. Uh, later. Now, there were a few people who either ran into a code bug or they ran into a, an issue with the way it worked in their design uh, or they ran into a scaling parameter which required them to remove it. So that, I'm not going to stand up here and say that doesn't happen or that it hasn't happened because it has, uh, but over the, it seems like the overwhelming majority, almost 81% of people who have, have enabled it have stuck it out. All right, so if you do not have it enabled currently, how likely are you to enable it in the future? Uh, so kind of, you know, where, what, what is your attitude towards enabling in the future? Um, and it's kind of a mixture between not at all likely people who really just have no interest in trying it um, and likely, you know, not, not yes, we're going to, anywhere between yes, we're going to do it or we're, we're thinking about it, we're working on it, maybe we're testing it in our lab, somewhere in that, in that neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> Okay, experience. So the next question was overall, how have, would you rate your experience with BGP flow spec? So if you're one of those people who's who's tried it, you've played with it either in a lab or in production, um, you know, how, how you know how has your experience been? Unfortunately, and I think this talks to the work that's still to be done uh, to, to make it a more robust solution. The overwhelming majority, in, in, uh, the respondents said almost 53% said that their their experience with it has been pretty negative. So. Um, clearly, still some work that we can do uh, around this technology as an industry. Um, how likely is it that you would recommend it to a friend? Fairly even across uh, across you know would wouldn't don't really care uh, you know fairly even spread. Not a real strong opinion there. Um, so for those people who do have it enabled, the question the next question was: Do you allow your customers to send you BGP flow spec routes via BGP? Almost everybody said no, so um, apparently that scares people to allow their customers to send them flow spec routes, although they allow them to send, a lot of people allow them to send destination black hole routes, so I find that kind of an interesting dynamic. But um, For those people who are doing flow spec, the next question was, do you have a web portal where your customers can log in and inject BGP flow spec routes through some sort of web tool? Um, and again, the, the overwhelming majority, almost 90%, was no, we don't, we don't allow that. Again, just, it either speaks one to two things in my mind. It either speaks to a lack of trust with the customers that they might do something they shouldn't and influence either other people's traffic or influence themselves in negative ways, or uh, just a lack of time in, to develop a tool such as that. Uh, do you have a central router from which you inject your BGP flow spec route? So this one was pretty close between the yeses and the noes, maybe a little bit more on the no than, than the yes side, but it seems like that's a f you know, um, fairly common thing as people are starting to use a, a central router, a route server of some sort to inject their flow spec routes in instead of just going out to a random edge router and configuring them there. Uh, do you allow a DDoS detection tool to send BGP flow specs into your IGP? So it doesn't necessarily have to be Arbor. That was just the first one that came to mind when I was doing the survey. But there are a number of DDoS detection tools. The question is, do you allow those to, to create these flow spec routes and inject them into your IGP tables? Uh, I'm sorry, your IBGP tables. And the overwhelming majority of that was, was um, no. Then the next highest category at 22% was Yes, after review. So uh, a lot of people, if they are allowing the a, a detection tool to create the flow spec routes and automate sort of the, the mitigation of the of the DOS attacks, they're making an employee, an engineer, or a knock guy double check and sanitize, sanity check them before they allow those flow spec routes to get to get created. 
Um, and then there's actually a higher number than I kind of expected to see. 17% of the respondents said that, yes, they just allow it to be automated. Now, they've probably, I'm assuming, done an, an, a decent amount of testing and have a low, obviously a level of trust in their detection tool that it's not going to create uh, going to create flow spec routes that don't make sense or that, that they don't want. All right, so, you know, when you're talking about any new technology, I always find it interesting to see, you know, do you charge for BGP mitigation? Is there a way we can... Um, make money with BGP flow spec and we charge for it. Um, the, the majority of the respondents said, about 57% said no, there are a few um, who did respond saying that they, that they do charge for it. Um, so there were a number of places where you could write in comments um, based on your answers if you wanted, wanted to give me more comment. And uh, I didn't put all of them in here, I just summarized kind of what the theme of the comments that I was getting was. And, Essentially, it comes down to most people that responded said that they thought that BGP flow spec was a good idea um, and that they would think that, of course, DDoS mitigation is an important issue to address and they'd love to see this take off, but um, the enterprise companies, the content providers, the, the, the non-service providers, I guess I would say, are waiting for the service providers to start accepting their BGP flow routes so that they can automate the, the DDoS detection I'm sorry, the DDoS mitigation by sending these flow spec routes, similar to what I showed in the uh, intra, D, uh, intra domain mitigation. Um, interestingly enough, kind of as a, I guess a, a sidebar, some respondents even said they would be willing to use that as a reason to pick a service provider. So if they go to RFP for a new service provider, um, they'd be willing to, to use that as a reason to choose one service provider or another. So maybe there is a way to make money in, in using BGP flow spec after all. Um, so the next thing that became somewhat, sort of evident in reading the comments in the survey was that <clears throat> while that's what the enterprise and content companies are waiting for, the ISPs, the service providers, are waiting for their vendors to support it, or at least they have been waiting for their vendors to support it to this point. They either need the particular vendor that they use, which may not be one of the three that, that I mentioned earlier, um, to support it, or they need it in a certain version of code from that vendor, a certain platform from that vendor, or they need specific features in their environment uh, that aren't currently supported, that they're working with their vendor to try and get some new features that they need specific to their use case implemented. Or it comes down to their vendor supports it, but it doesn't scale the way they need it to scale for the size of the network that they run, they, they have to maintain. Um, these are some, some of the references that I used for some of the articles I had as well as uh, where I got the, the configs from, from some, of the, some of the slides. Uh, that's it. I guess we'll open up the mics for questions if anybody has, has questions. I'm sure in this community somebody's got a question. Hey, Justin. Um, John Christoph from Team Carmory, maybe more of a comment than a question. Uh, so, I tried flow spec a couple of times. Um, one of the original times was maybe about three years ago here at NANR, the community flow spec project, and really fell flat. No one really took to it then, and probably for some of the reasons that you outlined. Uh, but the, the most, um, the, the biggest advocate who wanted to do it with me was someone whose name was on the original specification but had no network, so um, didn't really help us. But I've had, had two or three people since then um, reference that page asked me if I was still doing it. Um, and I told them, no, it fell flat, so then they said, oh, it's too bad. So we've started up a new thing recently, um, just doing a basically community remote trigger black hole service. And I've had about maybe I'd say five or six people who have asked for it, which surprised me a little. Um, not enough for me to justify doing it. One of the things that would help me, and I don't know if Juniper does, it's been a while since I've looked at it, is um, having a, a little bit better control over the policy. For, just to give you a contrived example, someone sends a flow spec route to block port 53 on 8.8.8.8, you know, perhaps by mistake, um, but obviously affecting probably some traffic that maybe they didn't intend to. So policy um, controls to be able to, to either reject or, or deal with uh, certain flow spec routes that I, that I get and ensure that, two, don't actually pass them on because I think it's um, a transitive um, attribute, too. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so as far as the policy goes, uh, 
you know, I can't speak to what Cisco and Alcatel have as far as their policy engines. I haven't really spent a lot of time researching that. But in, in the Juniper engine, you do have the ability to, to create some policy around what routes you're, you're going to allow in um, on the session, just like you do with, with unicast routes. And, and, and obviously, that's good I guess, sanitation or good best common practices if you're going to enable uh, PGP flow spec in your network. That's something you're going to want to spend some time thinking about, some time testing, and developing good policies around that. I don't know. I didn't catch who was first. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Ron Bukalski. Uh, just a question. I mean, the way you described in your survey about the providers who do support it or they don't support it, they, they would accept um, the flow spec routes from customers or not. It sounds like there's a piece missing about um, trust. And, or trust and verify. Like if, if a customer sends you a, a flow spec route that they say to mitigate, does the provider just take that and implement it? Or do they check and verify that that's really a, a DDoS going on before they mitigate it? And is, there, is that a mechanism that's part of what you're talking about? So I, let, me, let me ask a, a, a clarification on that. Are you saying that they would create a policy to verify that, that route should be allowed or that they would, in fact, check to make sure that a DOS attack is actively going on before they would accept the route? Well, I, mean, I, I guess both. Um, I don't know. I can't think off my top of my head of a, of a way that they would, unless they had already a, a traffic anomaly tool running inside of their own network, be able to tell whether there was an active attack for which that route matched and, and validate that um, be an interesting uh, an interesting design. I'm not, I'm not aware of a way to do that. Obviously, kind of back to, to John's question about the policy, you can obviously create policies to validate that the route that you're receiving that customer is um, allowed to send you, that it matches either a unicast route they're, that they're sending you or as part of a block that you're allowing from them, assuming you have route filtering on your customer's sessions, either using you know, a, a route database or, or manual filters, however you're doing it today with your unicast customer filters I mean because if you don't if you don't verify it as the example he gave where you know, if the customer says block 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 port 53 that can cause a pretty pretty huge impact on everybody it's not just one customer mitigating one customer's problem it's actually causing a bigger problem oh yeah for sure I mean it's definitely um you know not something you I mean PGP flow specs not something you clearly just turn on and let it do its thing and it's magic behind the scenes and you don't you know don't have any policies or, or or sanity checking around it right it's clearly something that you got to have some policy and and only allow certain routes similar to you know it's it's, it's maybe maybe even a little more than what we do with unicast but we do as a community most of us do the same thing with unicast where you don't allow routes that aren't out, that are unallocated space. They're part of the Bogon space. I mean, there's usually on, on edge filters for BGP unicast routes, uh, so some, some sanity check and validating of, of what's being sent. You'd want to do similar things, probably even a little more so for, for flow spec routes, for sure. Thank you. Hi, uh, Gary Hauser. Uh, I've worked on a couple of solutions this year utilizing this feature for various customers. And something that I found when I was researching was that there's very limited detailed documentation and even examples of utilizing this along with the other tools that would be required to make this a complete solution. And I, I kind of feel like maybe it's because this is in the routing domain and really the problem is a security problem that there are missing pieces. but. Uh, you know, and I plan on contributing the knowledge I gained over the last year to the BCOP that's currently under review. Um, but I think that's part of the problem is there's just not enough information out there and not enough general approaches to the missing pieces to say, here's the problems you have to solve and here are particular ways you could solve that, you know, to make it a complete solution as opposed to here's flow spec, it's a BGP thing, good luck. You know, which is kind of the approach that's been taken. Yeah, that's a fair sense. point. And um, I was talking to somebody in the hallway before the session, and they were asking me about, well, how do you get to the point where you even create the route? Right? You somehow have to 
<clears throat> figure out that there is a DOS attack going on and what does that DOS attack look like, right? In my example, um, I'm creating a flow spec route for DNS, uh, you know, UDP port, port, port 53 to a certain IP address. Well, how did I know that that, that was what the attack vector was, right? So I, I kind of glaze over that. There are some tools out there that can do those type of things for you, both commercially and, and open source. Um, but yeah, stitching those two together in a good document, whether it be a, a book or a, a white paper, right. I agree, Gary, is something that's missing that needs to be done. So I I'd love to see some of the, the stuff that you've done and, and see that fit back into the uh, into the BCOP, which is a, another good point I was gonna gonna bring up. Uh, if everybody hasn't seen the BCOP stuff that that um, uh, was talked about yesterday in the track around DDoS mitigation, uh, there's a number of things beyond just flow spec that are talked about in there. Good edge filtering and and reverse path filtering and things. Some of the things that I alluded to in the deck that I would encourage everybody to read through and take a look at and comment on too. As well. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I mean, even breaking it down into best practices for accepting customer flow spec and best practices for, um, you know, circulation domain of the routes and those kind of things, if they came out as the larger community of this is the approach that is considered best practice, I think that you'd see much more utilization here, especially now that we have three major vendors supporting, you know, the technology. So. Yep. Fair point. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Hi, Jason Rokich with Fairpoint Communications. Um, I guess my question is around what's already been discussed here um, to some extent, but the I look at the risks, ex especially of extending BGP flow spec capabilities to eBGP peers. Um, and I ask kind of what the biggest security concerns would be for doing so. And I think the biggest one that I came up with originally was just the, the case where, okay, they block Google DNS. Um, what I found looking at the RFCs is that the in order for an eBGP flow spec route to be accepted, it has to be validated against an existing unicast route from that peer. Right. Um, so assuming the vendor implements it correctly, I'm okay with that. I was wondering if there are any other major security concerns that we should be considering from accepting these routes from each BGP peers, if there's anything specific that would be risky other than maybe redirection communities. Yeah, I mean, I guess that it, it, there's two pieces of the flow spec, right, it is the matching criteria. You want to make sure that those matching criteria, they're matching something that they have um, authority to, to match against, which is a, a bit difficult to do, but things like the validation that's built into the protocol from the, from the in the RFC helps with. Uh, the second piece, of course, is the redirection or the filtering or the um, relimiting of the traffic. You got to make sure that that, there are, that, that doesn't cause any, any other problems. So it's, um, you know, so I think there are mechanisms out there. It takes a little bit of work. It's not something that's easy to just turn on and it, it just goes, but I think it, it, it can be done. Um, the other thing I would encourage, again, encourage people is if you're reading about it and you're finding things that are that are missing in it, um, feed that information you know, back into, the, into either the IETF or back into your, your vendor account teams when you talk to them that, hey, I need, I need this feature or this functionality, this additional checks or these additional things to be added for this really to be useful in my network because this is the way I plan on, on implementing, or this is, these are the concerns, the security concerns that I have about it. So. <clears throat> Hello, Carlos Vicente Dine. Um, I guess if I were a tier one provider, my concern would be, you know, if, if I have hundreds of customers sending me, um, you know, instructions to put ACLs on my core routers, that's kind of scary because of the per possible performance impact. Um, any, any, have you heard anything in that regard? Well, I mean, I guess there's uh, two ways to kind of, I don't want to say protect against that, but to, to try and mitigate that. And, and one would be setting something similar to a max prefect specific for flow spec routes so that, like, you know, only when cu each customer is only allowed to send, I don't know, you know, if they're only sending you 20 routes, you don't want them to be able to send you hundreds of flow spec routes. That would seem like it's overkill, right? Um, so, you know, let's say they can send you uh, 20 routes, maybe you set a max prefix at five, they can only send you five flow spec routes at any one time, right? Put a bound on it. Um, that would help. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the only thing I can really think of that would help with that. But it is it is something to, to consider that you're allowing your customers to send you to send you flow spec, and there are going to be scaling limitations in every vendor's architecture. Um, and knowing what those are, of course, is is something that's that you're going to need to do as part of your research and as part of your testing to find out all right how many how many flow spec routes can I receive, um, and even in a layer below that of those flow spec routes, how does that translate into firewall filters or access list, whatever your vendor calls it? How does that get pushed down to my forwarding plane, and how does that affect my forwarding plane's performance um, so that you can set you know, limits on how, how much of that you're allowing to happen? All right, thanks, everybody.